here at ETH Denver, aka Sporked Out. And today I have the absolute pleasure and privilege of being joined by Solange from Chainlink. Hi, Solange. Hi, Derek. How are you? I'm good. I'm excited to be chatting with you today, not only because I always love learning, and that's one of the most fun parts of being in this community, but because you in particular have been a pretty important part of my journey. You are on a very short list of people that I am very grateful for because I joined the space maybe a year and a half ago. I'm like kind of the 2020 cohort. You know how like every bull run, a bunch of people join the space. So I was in the 2020 run and folks like you and Patrick Collins and Nader Dobbit have been like really uh, beacons of what I think um, strong DevRel and education look like in this space. Because when people talk about Web3 being open source, it, especially at the social layer, they often say things like, yeah, people are just so kind and open and willing to share their knowledge. And so the open source ethos also applies like to the way we treat each other and treat new people especially. And so you stand out in my heart as somebody that has always been easy to talk to, very friendly, very happy to explain things, even though I've been a complete beginner. So I wanted to say, oh. I've been looking forward to this in particular because I have a lot of gratitude for you. Thank you, Derek. Wow, this is amazing. Yeah. Um, hi, Andre. So uh, I'll, if it's okay with you, Solange, as we go through things, I'll lift up um, comments or questions that come out of chat. Speaking of which, if you're watching this live, feel free to drop a GM. It feels good, and I'm always curious who's joining us. So Solange, before we get into um, what you'd like to share today on the Chainlink side, I am curious, how did you get to the role you're in right now? What kind of a background did you have before this role or even before working in Web3? What was your winding path to where you are now? <laughs> this is so funny. Um, really, really funny because um, I did computer science more than 20 years ago. But in the year that I finished, I opened a dance school, a ballroom dance school. So uh, I, I teach how to dance, Brazilian dances, samba, forró, something like that. <laughs> and, and then uh, I can, like the dance it's at night and we can work with computer science during the day. So I do both for many, many years. And uh, after a long time uh, doing this, I was tired and then... Uh, I sold the last school. I was only working with databases and so boring. And then I discovered Smart. blockchain. <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, wow, this you changed the world. And I'd like to be part of this. And this was 2017. Like I said, we joined in bull runs. And so you were on that 2017 <laughs> cohort. <laughs> very, yeah. very exciting time. And so uh, how did you end up at Chainlink? Uh, yes, Chainlink, it was uh, so interesting because before that, um, I love to travel, I love to teach, and but I am a developer as well. So how can I uh, merge all of this? Uh, I didn't know before that there are a whole that I can do this. And this is uh, be a developer advocate that what I am on Chainlink. I discovered this, this whole in 2019 in RSK a sidechain from Bitcoin, EVM compatible. And uh, since then, I am a developer advocate. And Chainlink is especially uh, like I choose Chainlink. Uh, I was looking the other companies that I like that make sense for me. And I told them, hey, I'd like to work with you. It was a long process, but uh, I did it. Wow. Um... I, I told the story to you before, but I'll say it for the folks that are listening. One time I was chatting with you because um, I, I finally got a chance to go to a couple events that were not Youth Denver just to kind of see how the space works. And I started to notice some of the same sponsors and some of the same DevRel people and even some of the same hackers and biddlers going from event to event to event. And I realized like, oh, in some ways, this is kind of like a circus that just goes around the world. And it's a lot of the same people seeing each other just in like exciting different countries like Bogota or Medellin or Paris or whatever. Uh, and so when I saw you uh, in San Francisco, I think it was Graph Hack. I was like, yes. wait, Solange, you're here too? Uh, well, how does this work? And you were like, well, Chainlink has a DevRel team and a developer advocate team, whatever you, what the title is. And uh, we've got a budget to send people around to travel. 
and I'm the member of the team that is the most interested and available for that. So I get to use up most of our budget and travel over the course of the year. And I was like, it sounds like a dream job. <laughs> you just get paid to travel around the world and stand behind the chain link table, but otherwise just like go network and meet people and build stuff. That's really exciting. So Yes, it's exactly this. And I really love to do this. Yeah. I, um, for anyone listening that thinks Web3 is cool um, and is interested in traveling the world, developer relations or developer advocate are positions that include some of that, depending on you know the org and exactly. the budget and the timing and so on. Yes, you must be a developer and you must to have some passion to teach and to bring in new people to this space. Yeah, something that I know you and I share pretty deeply. <laughs> uh, so speaking of which, what are what can folks look forward to learning today? What are we going to talk about? Well, today we are talking about oracles. Can um, I ask, I is have... that a baby or a bird? <laughs> mm, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> is it your neighbors? <laughs> uh, no, yes. Uh, zero knowledge, uh, zero are... knowledge. Okay, let's explain. Let's Okay. Uh, how can I say this in English? It's a parrot. Yeah. Okay, great. It seems yes. like a parrot. That makes so sense. So my neighborhood has a parrot. And uh, this parrot uh, is in love with me. Uh, like I live here uh, more than five years. And he use when I am teaching, uh, doing live classes, he, uh, uh, he is hearing my voice now. So he would like to he talk He gets with excited. Me. Oh, okay. Exactly now. He's encouraging you. Yes, and I know that exactly in this moment, my husband uh, go downstairs to give you like uh, some uh, cookies, something to him to be quiet. <laughs> I'm so happy I asked. Thank you for explaining. Okay, <laughs> so uh, and do you do you know the parrot's name? Um, no, uh, oh, okay. I always. My uh, okay. I, I don't know if he has a name. Like we we call them like Loro. The uh, uh, this is Loro <laughs> because Loro is uh, like a kind of parrot in Brazil. Okay, okay. So the Loro's here. I'm here. You're here, and uh, we've got a bunch of people excited to learn today. What are we gonna talk about? Yes. So let's talk about oracles. And, um, well, uh, I can tell all the people that this is like a small part that you can learn in the camp build in Endeavor. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. And uh, is this, I will share my screen now uh, and start to talk. I have some content that I can do like a hands-on session or only the theory, I will start with the concepts and let's see what's happened later, okay? Okay, and as we go through this, folks, feel free to ask all kinds of questions. We are happy to like explain any words you're not familiar with or acronyms or like if you see a word that you've seen used in other contexts but it doesn't make sense here, feel free to ask. The, the whole reason we do this live is so that it can be a little more conversational. Exactly, this is really, really amazing. And let's go. Let's share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, where, where I am? I lost my screen. Okay, here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't worry. And yes, I have two screens. You are here and I you share the other screen. Okay. Okay, great. And then did you find the share screen button here in the studio? Yes, I find it. Okay, great. I didn't find the other screen, but now it's good. <laughs> great. And three, two, one, go. There we go. Yes, here we are. And let's so go. let's present a bit. Let's get intimate. Boom. Yes. Okay, we're ready. Here we are. So this is me. My name is Solange Gueiros. The people know me by Sol. And uh, you already know that I am a developer advocate at Chainlink Labs. Here are, are my contacts. And uh, at the end, I can open my website that I used to, to add all the talks that I'm doing in Portuguese, English, and Spanish, some of them has like videos like this. You'll be there later and you can see the others. And I am Brazilian. Yes, I am Brazil just now. And mm -hmm. the counting the days to go to the infer. So soon. Yes. Uh, if you'd like to, to um, see, to read this QR code, this is a basic website that we have related to education, 
basic concepts like I can share it. like uh, smart contracts, oracles, NFTs, DeFi. So I think it's so important to all of us to have these basic context. Uh, concepts. I know that this, uh, all these live classes is to to this. And if you can hear more and read more, I'm pretty sure that this will help you. So let's come back here again. And uh, two seconds to you to get this. And this is, let's go. So first of all, let's talk about Oracle's fundamentals. And before that, I know that you already know this, but let's be sure. What are smart contracts? Think that smart contracts are computer programs that they are published and they run in a blockchain environment in an autonomous way. It means that when they are triggered or they when they are called, they don't have intermediaries and this is immutable because we are in blockchain. Okay, so they're like a like a, a function or a, a set of functions that exist, and that's the autonomously part is when you call it, then nobody is sitting there. There's no human that we're waiting for to click, okay, allow them to do it. It just exists there as something you can interact with. You don't need to ask for permission to send yes. one ETH from your wallet to someone else's or exactly. to interact with like a, an NFT mint, for example. Yes, and amazing because uh, you uh, important to understand that uh, it's autonomous, but we must uh, like uh, trigger them. We must call some function in the smart contract. What can I say? Uh, if we, you must receive a payment in the first day of the month, the smart contract by itself, he didn't know when in the first day of the month. So someone must call the smart contract because of this. I, I used to put this part. Hmm. Uh, another part that I can comment here that is so interesting as well, it's about the immutability. Because uh, the people um, sometimes um, did some, some mistakes related to this. What is immutable in a smart contract? The code, the source code, the definition of the contract. After we publish this on blockchain, we cannot change it. We can publish another and uh, say that we are changing the version and going to a different address, something like that. But uh, the code that was published cannot change anymore. In the other way, we can change the data that it's inside the content. If you create some functions to do this, so I can have a smart content that has uh, um, a function to save some information over there. And yes, in, in this way, I can change this information, but I cannot change the source, the smart content itself. So let's go. Uh, when we talk about smart contents, I really, really believe on this, that the smart contents will solve uh, the the problems in the society related to trust. So the idea is that we can uh, trust in the cryptographic, we can trust in, in the smart content, but not in the paper, not exactly in the people, something like that. Mm. Because we have, when we are talking about paper guarantees, we have the, the counterpart risk and not exactly this is transparent. Uh, this is um, not like you must trust in like a, a logo, a name. And when we are talking about cryptographic guarantees, we are talking about math. Um, so the counterparty risk is low. The smart content is transparent. It's in the blockchain. And um, it's better. And... Uh, like I said before, I already told you one limitation of the smart contents, but there are more, there are limitations in the smart contents. And in fact, one of the challenges is how can we connect the smart contents and that we call it the on-chain information, on-chain data, and the information that is off-chain, that is outside, that the real-world data and events. 
this is a challenge to the smart contents. And uh, uh, another point, and why this is a challenge. For example, if I try to, to query an API that it's in the outside, uh, outside the smart contract, mm -hmm. um, if uh, when we, ta we um, the nodes are trying to get the consensus, they must call this API again and they can uh, get different results. So if we are uh, calling uh, information that it's off chain, uh, we cannot have a guarantee that this information will be always the same. So we cannot say that this is deterministic and this is one of the challenges. Hmm. Uh, we cannot have the consensus outside the blockchain. And let's see how, if it, it, is it possible to solve this? Let's see. And uh, thinking about the connections that I was telling before, uh, we must, to, to the blockchain makes sense, uh, we must be in the world. So we must be connected with market data, events, payments, banks. We, we really must have this. And the solution to this are the blockchain oracles. And what, so what is an oracle? It's any device that interacts with the off-chain world. And we used to have these two, two different purposes. One, provide external data to use to consume a smart contract or to provide computation for smart contracts. We know that it's hard to, to do like uh, complex computation inside a smart contract, you'll be out of gas. So sometimes you need to do this outside and bring the results to the smart contract in a way that we can trust on this. Mm -hmm. And this is, we can say that oracles are um, any data sources or any external resources like I put here, like related to a watch or a football game, uh, some information from market stocks, uh, weather, um, quotes of fiat money. And we have a lot of things that we can use here. But when we talk about oracles, um, what happens if we have a centralized oracle? It means that the information you come from this one source. And this can be a point of failure. Uh, and think about when uh, we are already know that the smart content, where it's immutable, when we, you put your information in a smart content, you'll be saved in a transaction. Even if you try to change the information, like I told you before, I can create a function for this. But every time that I try to change this information, I miss sending a new transaction to the blockchain. So everything is registered. We have the, the history of everything. So the, the input of the information inside the blockchain, it's so, so important. And here is the point. If we are trusting in a centralized point to bring this information, this can be mm, not so good. Yeah, it could be manipulated or compromised or just go offline or any number of problems. I, th I, th I think the analogy here for folks that where this maybe isn't clicking the importance of this fully yet is to think over the past year how many examples of centralized exchanges uh, going under FTX being the more you know newsworthy example recently, but many even just in the few months before it. If you're relying upon a third party service, a single entity like an FTX and giving them your actual money and saying, okay, so you're going to help me hold crypto, right? And they're like, yeah, 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 trust us. <laughs> We're a single point of not failure. And then cut to, you're like, okay, can I have my money now? And they're like, we didn't actually have it. So that was sort of missing the entire point of using a decentralized network in a trust minimized environment. If you're having all these trust assumptions on this one single point, this organization, that if there's any, you know, 
uh, an employee hack or any any number of vulnerabilities that only exist there and not for the entire network, then in that one choice, you've lost the entire benefit of working in a system like this. So for that same reason, if you're trying to query like the ETH USD price off chain, I know now we have like liquidity pools we kind of use with stable coins, but if you're trying to query like the temperature or the time or something that exists fully off chain, don't just have one single point of failure because then you've introduced like you've sort of ruined the entire point. So if if that's something we want to make sure to avoid Solange, how do we do it? Yes. Let's go to um to a decentralized Oracle network. This is the idea. So we can get the real world data with a network of nodes, not only one node, and bring the information to any blockchain. And in the same way, we can provide the information that will have some kind of consensus to the real world again. And this is, so what's a decentralized Oracle network? Uh, we are talking about to have full replicas that are running by independent and civil resistant node operators, and they must have some consensus about a computation. Can be like a code, can be a weather data, stuff like that. Uh, so this network of nodes is not a blockchain. Uh, it's so important that this is only a network of nodes that they have their own consensus. They agree in the information that they are providing. And this is focused on data validation and the consensus about the uh, off-chain values to make them reliable uh, to trigger the contents, to be used in smart contents. And... Um, when talk about chain link, so interesting because these node operators, they are security reviewed uh, in order to, to have, like you said before, we cannot trust in one node, but, but we are reviewing all of them to try to trust in most part of them and to have a consensus of this. Wait, I can't just run 20 nodes and pretend I'm 20 different people? Uh, I, I hope that this is better than only one node. <laughs> Okay, I'm surprised by how it's civil resistant it is. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. And um, and I will show later that uh, depends of the information, we must have more or less nodes, for example. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. And uh, here are some uh, examples related to this, again, uh, related towards data sources that we can use in a decentralized Oracle network. And uh, you must think about the quality of data, the origin proofs, the how this data is delivered and the, the validation of this. Uh, if we have some crypto economic guarantees related to this, uh, like why these nodes are, are running this, can they be like um, uh, not civil resistance, stuff like that and uh, about data privacy as well. So it's must to uh, take care of these points in consideration. Mm. Ah, so I put this in the middle because when I'm doing some presentation, the people used to be so curious. So uh, get two seconds to uh, read this QR code and this is my presentation. I will send it at the end again, but let's share that the people can get it. Very sweet of you, thank you. I've never seen someone do that. So let's go. If you didn't get it now, at the end, I will show you again. And when I talk about all of this, maybe you will hear about a, a different name. The It's hybrid or it's hybrid. I hybrid. don't know how to say this hybrid, this word. Mm -hmm. Hybrid smart contents. And this is the kind of smart content that has this kind of connection. So these smart content are using oracles to get the information from the external world, from the off-chain data and computation. And um, this is the idea to bring it to the smart contents uh, this kind of connection with the decentralized networks and how 
we can use this inside the smart contacts. And the, here I had some use cases that probably uh, some of you already know, but uh, we need information from the off-chain world in decentralized finance, gaming, NFTs, enterprise systems, insurance, governance, and whatever. We have a lot of use case for this. And uh, okay, when we have this kind of connection, we can interact and connect everything. This is the idea, including uh, connect different networks, for example, and all of this. Hmm. And this is talking a bit more about Chainlink. So Chainlink, it's like uh, one of the solutions for connecting the smart contacts to the off-chain data. And uh, Chainlink is blockchain agnostic, so we can have the, the Chainlink network implemented in different blockchains. Like today, uh, we have this on Ethereum, is the, the, the biggest, but always in Polygon, Moonbeam, Avalanche, and others, including one part, for example, in Solana. So we really can be in different blockchains. And uh, so what's Chainlink? Now Chainlink is so big and uh, uh, it's been the, the standard for our Oracle network. Uh, I'm so proud to, to be on Chainlink because uh, they work in a way that is so, so professional to, to be this reference and to take care of our aspects that we need to have when we talk about oracles. And uh, we have, so I already talked about this, the quality of data services, uh, I will not talk again. This is important. So when we talk about Chainlink, we are talking about, we can say products or services, but we have different of them. And I will explain a bit more of each of them. For example, market and data feeds, I will show you a bit. We have the VRF, and this is a, a generator for random numbers. Uh, the proof of reserve, for example, it's like, it, this is so interesting that you can prove that uh, some reserve that is off chain or even on chain in another blockchain exists and use this in your, your smart content or the automation. I will talk a bit more about each of these. First of all, the chain link data fits. Uh, the chain link data fits was the first uh, service created by Chainlink, and this basically is the code of assets that we can use. And you use this especially in DeFi and in so many different decentralized Oracle networks. And the idea is to get data and asset prices in your smart contract from the external sources. Um, we have the full market coverage, not from uh, decentralized exchanges, but some centralized exchanges as well that are providing the codes uh, and uh, the chain link review them. Uh, and the, like, what's the information that we have here when we are talking about values codes is the volume based average method. And we have this in many, many blockchains. I will show a bit about this because yeah. I'm going to this link now, data.chain.link. Let's go. So this is the data feed that we can see. For example, if I'd like to know the code of Ethereum with USD, I can see in the mainnet, in Polygon. Uh, let's see more. I will open one of these and I'd like to, to show the difference for you. This and this. For example, this, I am on Ethereum. And you can see here that the mean, we must have at least 21 nodes. Now we have 31. And you can see that all of them are green. So they are uh, providing the data in a good way. No one is offline. No one is, are, 
uh, is providing a data that's so different than the others, something like that. If I go to Polygon, for example, in Polygon, uh, the minimum is 11. And we have 16, and this, so it's a bit different. It uh, depends of the chain. Uh, it depends the blockchain you are using, and you have different requirements. Uh, one point interesting is that each of these is a smart contract. So we have one smart contract that has the aggregator of this. So we are talking about a term aggregator. And the aggregator will put um, the information of each of these and the average code of this. And this is for, for both we can see here, uh, including what's happened with the nodes. This is interesting. So let's come back here. Hmm. I have a question. We yes. were talking a moment about uh, single points of failure. So as these 31 nodes on ETH mainnet are speaking to each other, oh, so sad, the screenshots when ETH was over 3,000. Uh, that's how it always goes. Um, when, when they uh, report their data and then there's some kind of average and then that average ends up being stored in that block in the smart contract on ETH mainnet so that other contracts can query it. Can we zoom in a little on the in-between there? Is it that all 31 nodes are reporting to some centralized chain link server, which then updates the contract? How can we be sure that there's no, you know, nothing happening in between? Uh, yes, we have, um, I, I didn't put this here, but we have uh, a concept uh, of OCR to report to this. Before, uh, it was each of the nodes that are uh, are saving the values because the values are saving in a smart content. So uh, we have, when this is saving the smart content, we have the value of each source. So like the address and the value that they provide. And then we have the average of this. So the, the point can be like uh, when this information is saved in the blockchain. But uh, this is monitored, so this is difficult to 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 happen. Okay. Yeah. And this, you you already have in my slide, so I put a lot of links that you can click and you can understand better this part. And also, I'm not doing this now, but in our documentation, you can, uh, you have an example to use on Remix, one button, go to Remix and deploy and test it. I love this. I do a lot of this in our camp with yeah. Remix. It's Looking forward to Camp Middle. Remix is very yes. beginner friendly for folks that have yes. zero programming experience or computer science experience. If I could figure it out, you could figure it out. And if you have any questions, Solange and I are here to help. Yes. Oh, let's let's tell a small history for you. I started my year uh, doing a bootcamp online in Portuguese here in Brazil. Uh, and uh, I, I use Remix like in five classes of two hours each. And we have more than 200 Brazilian students doing smart content. So uh, including a lot of people that told me, hey, I'm not a developer and I could do this. I'm so happy. So I'm happy with them as well. Wow. Yeah. A lot of gratitude because I believe Remix is maintained by the Ethereum Foundation, right? Yes. So I'm just to come back to how we started this, the open source ethos of the space. It means a lot to me that we have amazing tooling like that that's specifically for beginners being maintained by the Ethereum Foundation, putting their money where their mouth is and saying, we want to onboard folks to Web3 and make that an easy process. Yes, this is so important. It starts again. Uh, so let's talk about the proof of reserve. Uh, this was uh, this became more important last year exactly after FTX uh, because this is a way that you can prove uh, what what you have what the exchanges have. We know that in some cases uh, the problem is not what they have but exactly what they are doing with the other part, what the commitment. But this can help a bit. And uh, the idea 
is to, to prove on chain the collateralization of assets. And uh, it, this can help uh, reduce insolvency risks uh, and uh, the transparency for the users or like prevent system fails in DeFi. For example, I created a smart contract last year that uh, is checking the, the amount of the reserves of Bitcoin that BitGo has uh, because they are the owner of the 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 BTC on Ethereum, one of the the the, the assets that we have. Hmm. Um, so uh, and then I can say how many uh, bitcoins they they minted in the Ethereum network and how many they have in the Bitcoin network and compare. If in some moment they minted more than they have in collateral and I have a smart contract that are using this, I will stop my contract. Like this is a, a risky. Mm -hmm. So something like that. And uh, how this works, uh, this is a bit tricky because we are like trusting in an institution or uh, can be an institution, like if you need the information from a bank, but can be another chain that we have a, a network of nodes that is getting the information, send it to a smart contract, and your smart contract, your decentralized application can read this and use this. And here I put some examples that we have. Uh, I was talking about the WPC. And these are the resources. So let's talk a bit more now about the VRF. So what is VRF? We are talking about verifiable random uh, numbers, uh, basically. And uh, what is this? And uh, first, why we need this? Why it's hard to get randomness with smart contracts? Remember that I start telling you that blockchain is deterministic. So we are talking about the perfect prediction. So if you have a rule inside your smart contract to generate a random number, uh, when you are sending a transaction, like the node can manipulate this the node who is validating this. Uh, so uh, this can be a point of failure. Something like that. The participants can control the entry if they know what's the rule. Before go to the network, the entry can be wrong. And the idea of the chain in KVRF, it's an external a network of nodes that is providing these, these random numbers. You ask a number or two or three or whatever, and the network, you provide this for you, and you have this um, in a transaction, and you can prove that this, uh, you can check like the nodes and be sure that this was really random numbers. And uh, where we use the random numbers? Uh, we can use, for example, to in NFTs to generate different parts, for example, different heads, different hats, different weapons, eyes, whatever. You can have different characteristics using the VRF and uh, is used as well, for example, in, in battles to define who you won, who you lost, something like that. I have an example that I will not do today, maybe in the bootcamp. Like we have a game that uh, you have some, some character that you jump around the world and uh, how many uh, kilometers it is jumping is defined by the VRF, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you'd like to test the VRF later by yourself, uh, the VRF, it, have, it has a manager. So you first create like your account and uh, you would put some link token over there. And then you will register your smart contract and your smart contract can consume from this account. 
And uh, talking about this, it's important because when we asked, was talking before related to data feeds, uh, you don't need to pay to use your data feed. Uh, you are doing a query to do this, like the nodes and uh, they are interested in providing this information to us. It's, it's basically a public good that anyone can use exactly. as much as they want. Exactly. Uh, but in this case, you are interested in having this number, so you need to pay to have this. Okay. So this is a different approach. Sure. Yeah. I mean, just to really spell it out, this is part of how Web3 lets us use things like tokenomics to be able to incentivize certain behavior. If you want someone to have their computer generate a random number for you, then you're going to pay them some link token to be able to do that because that costs them electricity and so on. Exactly. So here we are. You can click in any of this, these resources layers. And in the same way, I put the QR code of the documentation. We have a remix um, mesh key button to open remix and create as much content for you. And the next product that I'd like to talk is the chain link automation. And first, why we need the chain link automation? Remember that I told you in the beginning that the smart contracts are not self-executing. Uh, they are passive agents. So they cannot start uh, alone a process or, or call its functions from time to time or to check conditions. Uh, and we used to say that this, uh, we have the changes of the state of the blockchain, or, or it means the change in the state of a smart contract. This only happens when a transaction is initiated by an external account and can be a user, a Oracle, or other smart contract. Mm -hmm. And this is the chain link automation is here to solve this. We are talking about a decentralized smart contract automation network. Again, we have a decentralized network of nodes and they are rewarded for running the register process that we call it upkeeps. And so I you create my contact then I will go to the automation network and I will register my content in this network. Uh, since then, the network, you check my content and if some condition that I define it uh, is true, the network, you execute whatever I'd like to do. And this, 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 I love this picture. Like we have here, uh, automation before was, call, was called keepers, okay? Sometimes you, you see the name keepers because of this. So the keepers nodes, this network, you simulate a function called check up keep. Your contract must have this function. And if it, when they simulate this, the result is true, uh, the, the network will simulate another function called uh, upkeep, perform upkeep. And then this will update your smart contract, change something in your smart contract. And like this, imagine that if you don't have this kind of decentralized network, okay, you can, you can create your job, your bot on Amazon, but you must trust on Amazon or wherever, or any cloud service, or even in your computer, in your home that can uh, don't have power, for example. So uh, this is a great way to have a decentralized network of nodes working to you and uh, guaranteeing your, the rules of your contract. And this is what I, I was telling before. We have the check, the simulation of check upkeep. And if this is true, we have the simulation of the perform upkeep. And only if the simulation of the, the, the execution is true, the transaction will be sent to the blockchain. So you only uh, like uh, pay to do this when everything is 
true. Everything is good. And you are paying this in link as well. And the, a part of the link, you'll be converted to it to pay the gas to execute this function. In the same way, I put here another QR code. If you'd like to test it, we have here an uh, example how you can create a compatible contract to use the automation. And the documentation. I will not do the hands-on part. I think it will be more than 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So let's go. Uh, it's supposed to be a dynamic NFT, but I promise that I will do this in the bootcamp. Okay. And I, I need to tell you something so important, so important. Uh, I cannot tell exactly what, but I can tell you that we are launching a new product during the bootcamp, during the camp build. And, during uh, November. Yes, exactly. And our students in the camp, you'll be the first students to use this. What is it? This is so rude. I w I can you tell me anything about it? I I mean it's from Chainlink, so presumably it has to do with yes. some kind of off-chain yeah. computation that is, we've yes. been yearning for in the space. Exactly. Think mm. that we talk about uh, codes, but probably we need to talk. Uh, we need more uh, more resources to um, to use other kind of computation and other kind of data. And probably you I'm gonna say to... because NFTs have been hot, it's gonna be related to the real world data of GPS, for example. Maybe it'll solve the use case knowing where people are and being able to verify in a trustless way when mm -hmm. uh, people do certain actions off chain so that we can like have that trigger smart contracts in some way. Oh, maybe. No, okay, Let's that see. wasn't it. Um, <laughs> you just, uh, yes. Uh, if you didn't apply it to our bootcamp, I really recommend you to do this because mm -hmm. you will learn, our students, you learn things first of everyone. It will be amazing. Yes. Um, as, when you're done with your slides, I'll show them the, how they can apply if they're still curious. Perfect. And uh, again, this is the presentation. Uh, you can have some seconds more to try to, to read the care codes. And I think it's this. Okay. Like you have it here the documentation. Here are my contacts again. Oh, I promise you that uh, the last thing that I shared. So this is my website. And choose your language and go to events. And you can see, like, uh, this is my event since 2019, I think. I didn't put 2018 before. But you can see what I did in, in English, Spanish, and Portuguese, and be fun. Whoa. Uh, <sighs> yes, if you go here, uh, uh, I started in Portuguese. So Portuguese, I in the f five years, four years, I did more than 200 events. Um. That, that's a lot. The, the Portuguese blockchain community is very lucky that you're out here doing all this work. <laughs> yes. I'm proud to be here. Hmm. Uh, how I, I may try to stop. Yes. Okay, great. And then I'll go ahead and remind folks that this year, ETH Denver is having its first Camp Biddle program during ETH Denver on site. It is starting February 24th, just like Biddle Week is. And for folks that don't know about it, this is a program for noobs, no Web3 knowledge, no smart contract knowledge. We are assuming you are not a computer scientist. We are truly trying to bring in folks like myself that are transitioning from a completely different career or job or just curious and want to learn a lot more. We are running Camp Biddle. Chainlink is powering this uh, both financially and also in terms of uh, curriculum and the uh, instructor power behind the scenes, making sure this is an incredible curriculum. I think the thing I'm most proud and excited about is that the folks that are coming get to specialize in one of four different tracks. In the beginning, you'll learn a little bit of everything. So that way you know what the other people on your team at East Denver or other people at a team in a Web3 project you're contributing to 
what they do, what it means when they say, I'm going to merge the pull request for the smart contract code to GitHub. If you don't know what those words mean, you'll know what they mean after two days. And then in the next four days, you go much deeper, either learning about smart contracts, front ends, community and marketing, or design. I am in particular excited for the design track because I want to see if we can push forward the basic principles of design and some common sense thinking uh, to make the dApps that we use day in and day out a little more user friendly and think a little bit harder about onboarding folks that are new to the space because we are getting more and more people in the space every year. And we're still in that very early rough around the edges kind of phase where it's really easy to accidentally sign a message. I mean, um, Kevin Rose of uh, Moonbirds, if I'm not mistaken, there was a very sophisticated um, targeted attack on him recently where he just signed a message. It wasn't even a transaction, but it was an exploit that allowed the person to um, basically take a bunch of NFTs that he'd given permission to on OpenSea from him. And that was many, many thousands of dollars worth of stuff lost just from one person. In other words, you still got to be very careful in this space. The UX is tough and there is no undo button. There is no customer support to call when it comes to on-chain stuff. So I understand I'm sympathetic to folks that use centralized exchanges because there's less risk of making a mistake yourself, but then you take on the risk of them being a bad actor, which unfortunately we've seen happens. So if you want to help build some of that infrastructure and make Web3 a better place for folks over the next few years, or even just over the next couple of weeks, apply to Camp Biddle at ethdenver.com forward slash Camp Biddle. We still have some spots available. So if you apply today, you might just get lucky. Um, we're already at a wait list. And if any more spots open up, I would be very excited to see the folks watching. And if you can't come, tell your friend. If you know anyone that would be a good fit for the program, in other words, they're going to be at ETH Denver and they want to learn more, tell them. Because we're putting in a lot of work to make this great. Specifically Solange. I think Solange, this is in many ways your brainchild. This is an evolution of things that you've done before. So I want to thank you for championing this idea and always being a champion of noobs. Like I said in the beginning, noobs like me. I, I got where I am largely due to the, not just the content that you put out and the technical knowledge, but just that spirit of like, you can do it. You belong. We can do it together. Let me know if you need help. So I, I know I'm speaking for both Solange and myself and countless other people in the space when I say, whatever your journey is, whatever you want to learn, whatever you want to do, we are here to support you. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us in Discord. You can find us at ETH Denver. Just come say hi. We are truly happy to support because I don't know, Solange, if you agree with this, in many ways, it feels like we've made it. Like I feel very grateful to be in a position where I can be a part of a cool organization doing interesting things and getting to coordinate with interesting people. And so I just want to spend the rest of my life helping other people make it and helping other people accomplish their dreams and build the things that are in their hearts and minds. So I'm curious, what would you say to folks that are kind of on the fence, like interested in Web3 and in crypto, but like, I don't really understand it. I still feel like an imposter. I don't know where to start. Do you have any advice that you give to people that are curious? Well, I think uh, I'm pretty sure that if you came to the camp, you will learn. And I used to to make all people create their first smart contract. Doesn't matter if you are a developer or no. If you know how to copy and paste, you can create your first smart contract and understand what is this. So, and remember, when you are creating your, your smart contract, you are creating something that you be forever in the blockchain. It's like to write in this stars. So this is really, really amazing. And I'm pretty sure that uh, to, to be in the blockchain world, in the Web3 space, uh, make difference in our lives. And we can be better, we can... Uh, trust more in decentralized systems and not only on brains and this is so so important to us and uh, I'd like to help everyone to be here is this yep just this <laughs> um, where can folks find you on Twitter or elsewhere if they want to follow up with you I know you showed it on your slides a moment ago but if you could just reiterate for folks that want to get in touch with you this is interesting. I already put my in my name what's my handle, and this is my handle in every network. 
And be careful, for example, if you find like uh, Instagram with something in the middle is not me. No if underscores in the beginning, middle or end. Exactly, exactly. Uh, even any network, my... No my link business. token, airdrop, DMs. No, this mm -hmm. isn't... The, we don't have a drop. Uh, the only way to stake a link is in the official website and disclose it. It's finishing four hours like here past year wait the next <laughs> great well thank you so much for your time solange um anything else you'd like to say to folks before we say goodbye oh i hope to see you in denver guys yep if you see either of us come on up and say hi um solange please join me in uh what i ask every guest to do embarrassingly which is give everyone a big bye bye <laughs>